back. Today we're going to be in chapter 10, but before we go there, let's have a word with the Lord. Heavenly Father, most high and holy righteous God, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity, Father, to gather together, to get deeper into your word, to come to a better understanding of it. And Father, I just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and grant us that understanding. Help us to see, Lord, how things apply to our lives as well. How your word, Lord, was, is, is as true today as it was the day it was written. And Father, help us to then live in your truth, in your righteousness, and let others see you through us, through our words and through our behaviors. Father, help us to be your good ambassadors. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So today we get to transition from the wisest man to his polar opposite. That's as nice as I can put it. Yeah, Schofield calls it folly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And I think that's probably as, as accurate as we're going to get. Maybe it's his bipolar opposite. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. And Rehoboam went to Shechem. What chapter? I'm sorry, chapter 10 of uh, 2 Chronicles. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard of it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. Now I'm going to take a quick time out right here to remind us about Jeroboam. Jeroboam tried to overthrow Solomon, and as a result, uh, had to run with his tail tucked between his legs down to Egypt to keep from being killed himself. But God had promised Jeroboam that he would make him a king over Israel. So, this is God fulfilling that promise. We'll, we'll see here, because God, God sees so much further into our future than what we know. And it's not that he sees into our future, but all of our future. He knows exactly what's coming. And so he just told Jeroboam what his position was going to be. All right, so let's pick back up. Verse 3, And they sent and called him, so Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. We're going to take a, time, a quick time out right here. What they're asking for is, is just, you know what, relax the taxes a little bit. Let us keep some of our money. Do you really need to be able to, you know, to, to live that extravagantly? Can you cut back a little bit and give us a break? That's what they were asking for. Remember in the last chapter that, that none of the Israelites were doing any hard labor anymore. It was, it was other peoples from other nations that were doing all the hard work. Israel had it pretty good under Solomon but they were paying a whole lot of taxes to maintain him and, and his livelihood and all the, all the kings and, and, and important people that would come to visit, they were having to pay to keep that up. And now they're asking, look, we already know, ain't nobody coming to see you. We'd kind of like to have some lower taxes as a result of that. All right, so let's pick it up at verse six. And King Rehoboam, took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? Now there's something he did that was smart. He went to the same guys who counseled his father. So there's, these guys have had some of Solomon's wisdom rub off on them. And he went to them first. Verse 7, And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, 
and please them and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. See, they were saying, give them the tax break. You can afford it, it'll be okay. We can do this. And then they will be your people always. The opposite is true then, if you don't. But they didn't speak that directly, or at least the Bible doesn't say it. So let's go to verse eight. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. So, you know that, that saying that we need to go ahead and, and put a bunch of teenagers in charge while, you know, while they still know everything? We're talking that right here. Now, these guys aren't teenagers, but these guys certainly think they know everything. It's, well, I'll get into it here in a minute. No parallel or anything. No. No. We'll get into verse 9. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people, which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto, the, unto thee, saying, Thy father made your, our yoke heavy. But make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My father, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Woo! How's that for some advice? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you thought, you thought that was heavy. Oh, no. No, no, no. Watch me lap up luxury. Watch me put you down into the dirt trying to work so that I can live way above you. Watch me and how hard I drive you people right into, the, right into your death so that I can live extravagantly. That's, that's their advice to him. Dave, that seems... Seems to me that this thing is uh, son saying, I'm not going to take less than my father. Yeah, exactly. I want equal. Yeah, I want more. I want more. more. Yeah, I want more. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how you can have more with Solomon. I know. I mean, you know, what, what else do you get that, that Solomon didn't have? But, but he's saying, I want more, and you're going to give it to me. Yeah. You will do this. I am your king, therefore. You have to do what I say, but we'll see otherwise. So let's pick up in verse 15. Nope, let's pick up in verse 12. I don't want to skip too far ahead. I almost did it. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king bade, saying, come again to me on the third day. So here they are. What's your decision? And the king answered them roughly. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God, that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahiah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. All right, so he spoke, he spoke their advice verbatim to the people of Israel. <laughs> they were saying, no, 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 it's our turn. It's our turn to be the, the leaders, to, to live in the lap of luxury. It's our turn. And we're not going to give it up even, even the least little bit. We're going to demand even more. It didn't go over well. So he's made his proclamation to Israel. Now here we go in verse 16. And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king saying, What portion have we in David? 
and we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents. O Israel, and now, David, see to thine own house. So all Israel went to their tents. Here's what they just said. Then we're not following you. If, if the house of David, who God put over all Israel, is not going to, to take care of them as part of Israel, then they won't be a part of, of this anymore. And David can take care of his own house, the house of David. Rehoboam can just rule over Rehoboam and anyone that happens to be in his household. So this is a division. This is a split in the country that shouldn't have happened, but did. So we're about to see all of Israel go one way. Ten tribes go one way. Yeah. And Judah and Benjamin the other. Okay? That's what's happening right here. Verse 17. But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadaram that was over the tribute, and the children of Israel stoned him with stones that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot and flee to Jerusalem. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day, to the day that this is written. Okay? That's a statement from Israel. Send your tax collector and you'll not get him back. We already said, we're not paying your taxes. We're done with you. We do not recognize you as king anymore. We refuse to pay your taxes anymore. And when you send somebody, don't expect to see them ever come back again. That's Israel's message back to Rehoboam. Rehoboam got the message very clear. He hopped in his, in his Ferrari and off they ran, <laughs> right? His two horsepower Ferrari. His, his two horsepower Ferrari <laughs> and, made, and made it back to Jerusalem where he felt safe. But it's his fault that things happened the way they did. It was his greed that got in the way. It was also that he didn't listen to wise counsel of the older men. And all he had to do was relax the taxes just a little bit and say, you know what, guys, you're right. I see it, and I'm gonna do something about it. And so as of now, I'm gonna reduce taxes by X percent. I'm not gonna throw a number out there because you know don't wanna get into that. But, but he could have reduced the taxes on them a little bit. He still would have been living very comfortably in a palace that that was his father's. He would have had his father's throne. He should have been following in his father's footsteps in seeking God. But Solomon himself had wandered from seeking God in his older age. And that's where things kind of really began. Because Rehoboam started seeing Solomon getting by with this, that, and the other that God said he's not supposed to do, so why should he listen? This is a, this is a powerful statement to all fathers out there. You, you, are, you are the example to your children. You are what they model themselves after. Now, I had, I had very good fortune. God blessed me. I honestly tell you, I, I tell everyone I meet, I have two, the two best parents in the entire world. My dad didn't hesitate a moment to whoop me when I deserved it. <laughs> but he, he loved me the whole time. I've never once ever doubted my father's love for me, which helps me to see that my heavenly father can have an even deeper love for me, just as he does for you. It is so important that we, as parents, be right and proper with our parenting as well. All too often these days, 
We see parents who are absent from their children's lives. They want to put them in front of a TV or a video game and just turn them loose and say, oh, well, let them be the babysitter. Take some time to be with your kids. Get to know who they are and let them know who you are. Be a stand-up kind of parent. Show them. Show them that following God is the right thing to do. And I think that's all I have to say about that. Any questions, comments? Well, you know, uh, Dave, with this decision, and it separated the ten tribes to the two tribes, mm -hmm. that was such an important decision. Mm -hmm. It lasted for centuries. Yeah. It, yes, it, 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 never, it never got put back together. You know, not not by man, and you know it will be put back together by God. But it has, it goes on and on until both of them go into captivity, eventually. It says, <laughs> henceforth it is a kingdom divided against itself. In Matthew twelve, yep, twenty five. This is Schofield. The two kingdoms are to be un reunited in the future kingdom. And not till then. That's a long way off. Yep. Yep. Man tore it apart. <coughs> Man tore it apart, and it'll take God to put it back together. And what you said about your the parentage, that can happen. And if that's bad, then the generation and generation. And it just generation. keeps following. Yeah. It just keeps following. This is. I think this is why God said that. That you know, I visit the sins of the father up to the third and fourth generation. It's because when that father was that sinful, he taught his children to be that sinful. Sure. And, and they try to turn it around. God, were, God would, would reward the child who tried to turn it around, but it still follows. We see that, we're gonna, we see that, we already saw it when we went through, through Kings. We saw how it followed. You know, about half of Judah's kings were, were considered good kings. And none of those in Israel, not one, was considered a good king. One was considered more evil than the rest, but that's not a, that's not a prize to be, you know, holding your hand up saying, look, I won, I'm the most evil guy. <laughs> that's just, just not a good thing. Duncan, you had something. <clears throat> one can almost wonder if Rehoboam and these young men of his weren't purposefully inflicting pain that they didn't need to. It sounds that way, doesn't it? Because he, he, I mean, it even says he spoke roughly with them. So he didn't just come out and say these things. He basically barked it at them. Scorpions? Yeah, you know. He, it, it came out as, as anger and bitterness toward them. And, and you can see why they said, well, then we have no place here. We have no place. This is, you know, that... Look at our own history, and this is kind of like taxation without representation, right? It's, it's kind of the same concept here. It's like, you're, not, you're just going to tax the fire out of us without us having any say whatsoever. And we're asking that you ease that burden, and you're saying, no, we're going to raise it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Since you've uh, asked for less, I'm going yeah. to do more yeah. just because you asked for less. Yeah. Yeah, and you go back to, you can go back to, to uh, Pharaoh in Egypt, and he says, oh, well, since you're going to threaten me with that, Moses, I'm going to double the workload and take away the straw. <laughs> well, how do you expect us to make bricks? I, that's up to you. That's your problem. Talk to your Moses here and see what he can do. Of course, eventually he found out that, you know, what a bad idea that was. And Rehoboam has just found out what a bad idea his attitude is. Yeah. You know, until they get their head out of their dark yes, dark place. <laughs> and, uh, out of the out of the cave. King, they're going to continue to have problems. Yeah, yeah. I I heard a, a well, I watched a video a long time ago. Um, Isaiah fifty three is a forbidden chapter. They don't read it because it is 
too easy to say, that's Jesus. And a lot of the, the, the Christians that are over there witnessing to them will ask them, have you ever heard Isaiah 53? And they'll say no. And so they'll get their Bible and they'll open it up and they'll read Isaiah 53. And they'll say, now who does that sound like? And they say, you should. Another young gal uh, said that the only time growing up, the only time she heard the name Yeshua was as a cuss word. That was it. Until she had met some people who explained exactly who he is. <laughs> and she came to believe through Isaiah 53. It, it was, it's awesome. So they don't want to believe, as, as Dad had mentioned. They don't want to believe Jesus because, well, because then they have to step out of their darkness, don't they? They have to step out of their darkness into his light. And Jesus said, that's why people sin. That's why they refuse is because they love their sin. They love their darkness. They don't want to come into the light. It's their comfort place. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm just going to tell you that there is no, there is no twilight area with, when it comes to Jesus. You're either in his light or you are not. It is a very crisp line. You are or you are not. There's a veil. Yeah. Yes. Over their eyes. Yes. The blindness has been imposed. Yep. Yeah, and they and they will continue to to live in their folly. Sadly. But but there is that whosoever will. Yes. And you can be that whosoever will. All you have to do is will. <coughs> That's it. You just have to choose. I'm going to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Yes, sir. On the Wednesday night Bible study, um, in uh, Corinthians, Second Corinthians uh, 3, 13 to, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, 18, talks about the veil. And uh, it's very um, interesting about the, the veil being over the... Oh, yeah. Over. It talks about Moses. Yeah. And then it talks about uh, the people. Um, and then the last verse it says, But we all, with open face, behold, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, and are changed unto the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, and there he's talking about we will be transformed from, from this body into the glorious body that, that Jesus had after his resurrection. Yeah, that's, and it, that's a, it's, it's, it's a powerful statement, you know. There's, there's, a, there are, there's a veil put over their, their eyes, the wicked. They refuse to see. But it's their refusal that is the veil. Because if they decided, if they, had, if they decided to pursue and look at the Bible, to really look at Jesus. I love, I love it now when they say, oh, I follow the science. No, you don't. If you followed science, you'd be a Christian. And it's an absolute fact. There are things in the Bible that will blow your mind away that science is only recently starting to understand. And the Bible has said it for thousands of years. And some scientists have acknowledged They've even said, you know, we strove all these thousands of years to come to this knowledge only to see the hand of a Christian reaching down to pull us up there to him. Because of the Bible said it first. It's cool. That veil, though, is their own doubt. That veil is their own willfulness. I don't want to learn because I love my darkness. Mm -hmm. God said, let there be light. They say, no, we want to stay in the dark. They hide their candle under a basket. Well, it's, it's really the will of sin turning mm -hmm. round and round. And mm -hmm. the feel good message we're hearing oh, so sin. many yeah. people claiming to be evangelists. Yeah. 
and the feel good message. Yeah. And and yeah. it's okay to do this, that, and the other. God will forgive it. You know, where's repentance fall into that? Well, where, you know? and where is sin and the need yeah. for Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. It's because that's why we need Jesus. Yes. The law. <laughs> Otherwise, where are we? We're in hell. Yeah. The law that God gave was a mirror to show us that that we're sinners. No matter how many times you wash the mirror, it, you're still dirty. <laughs> that's right. And so the law was only there to show us our need for Jesus, that we are sinful. You have broken this law, this law, this law. That You broke all these laws. Even if you only broke one, you're still a yeah. lawbreaker. And justice has and, to be served, which is hell. And the wages of sin is death. There we go. And the only way to life everlasting is through Christ Jesus. And that's where people don't want to open their eyes. They're okay saying, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as that guy. <laughs> you know, they compare themselves to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> well, Adolf Hitler isn't the bar. He might be the low bar, but he's not the bar. Christ Jesus is the mark. Yes. It's absolute perfection. Well, there's only two types of people that get into heaven. The perfect and the people that have accepted Jesus' blood to cover them. Yes, yes. So <laughs> Jesus was the only one who was perfect, by the way. Yes. And the rest, the rest of us, it's, it's like Pastor says, nobody's going to ask, how'd you get here? Because <laughs> there's only one way. There's only one way. Jesus says, I am the door. You can't go through any other way. There is no other door. There's no windows. There's no way to sneak your way in. It's Christ Jesus and only Christ Jesus. I share just a quick little funny incident. A dear friend of mine, he since uh, uh, passed away. Uh, he was of another faith. But in one of their classes, the teacher uh, was talking about the Lord being the perfect one. Mm -hmm. And... And so he asked as a class, has, does anyone here, have they ever known a perfect person? This guy's hand goes up. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the teacher was kind of dumbfounded and said, yeah. says, yes, my wife's first husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Must have been. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's funny. That's a true story. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good that, to be able to to laugh too. Yeah, it really is. Even in even in the darkest of times, it's okay to laugh. Yeah, it's a good thing. All right. Well, I think that's all I have to say about that. Any other questions, comments? Thanks right. for the lesson, Dave. Let's uh, let's let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for just giving us this opportunity. Help us then, Lord, to worship you in a right and proper manner. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our salvation, God. Thank you for making it all possible. Thank you for creating. God, you, you chose to create. And we that are created really should be showing an appreciation to our Creator. Thank you, God, yes. for loving us the way that you do. For you loved us so much, you sent your only begotten Son. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be whosoever's. Lord, to giving us that option to choose to follow Jesus. We thank you, God, for the wonderful experience that we have in you. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to share your word, to share that joy with everyone we meet. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Amen.